Hello. Our story begins shortly after Mace Windu and Dooku return from their mission to Rax the Segundas. Councilmember Katri had just been buried as the Council and other fellow Jedi memorialized her as she became one with the Force. Following the ceremony, Dooku asked his friend Mace about the rumors surrounding a potential ascension to the High Council. Mace was 24 years old, still young and eager, but he informed Dooku that these rumors were correct. The 54-year-old Jedi Master was very disappointed in this, believing that Mace was well aware of the Council's decision before they left for Raxus. Mace informed him that he was not aware, they were both assigned to the mission at the same time. However, due to the circumstances surrounding the Senator's death, Mace told his friend that he would speak to the Council on his behalf. Dooku found this notion to be a jab in the heart. While Mace was attempting to follow the Jedi Code, Protocol, and be honest with their mission statement, it was clear to Dooku that time had done the Jedi Order in. Mace was simply a product of the nurturing of the Order, and as Dooku understood, the Order was not what it once was. Their political service to the Republic outweighed their service to the people of the galaxy. Dooku was upset with Mace in the moment, but he still had hope that his young companion would see the way. It seemed unlikely at this moment, but Windu had such potential. The youngest to become a knight in generations, training Depp and receiving an invitation to join the council before the age of 25. It was a feat for sure, but Dooku hoped that his friend would become capable of seeing the fallacies in the Order, to see that the Council's loyalty to the Republic was forcing the Jedi further from their path. Dooku carried on, standing outside the temple for some hours, until dusk turned the dark and he made his way inside. He remembered what life used to be like inside the walls of the temple. It was close to 40 years ago when all of that changed. He remembered his master telling him how the change was good. Dooku didn't see issue with Yoda's statement at the time, but now it was clear that the specific change in question wasn't. The temple used to be littered with flags, color, senators, political allies, and sure, Dooku hated the idea that the temple was once a hub of political activity, but it was more than this. Dooku being born in 102 BBY saw the golden robes of his era. He saw Jedi who wore just capes without robes, like him. He could see the difference in the tone of their order. It was once the shining, glimmering example of hope in the galaxy. Dooku's feet fell before him as he slowly made his way to his room, remembering all the differences from his youth. It was true that with age, things become more dreary. As a child, it's so much easier to see the wonder in the galaxy. It's so much easier to say that life was easier as a whole when you are a child, because it was. There was no doubt in that. But sometimes it felt like, to Dooku, the galaxy was shifting to a point of no return. The Order itself, something Dooku still believed in, felt like it no longer could change with the times. The hubris of the Council was held back by a combined thousand or so years of experience, between Yoda, Opa Rancisis, and Yariel Poof alone. It was hard to give them a pass. Those three Jedi had served on the Council for centuries. Dooku stopped at the door and took a deep breath, before entering and eventually going to sleep. The entire mission to Raxus Segundus messed with his head. Dooku started to understand something, based off the words of Master Windu on Raxus. Dooku asked a question while they were there, regarding the Jedi. The question was if Mace thought the Jedi could truly maintain peace if they take everything the Senate says as law. To which his friend responded optimistically, telling Windu that luckily, the Jedi are guided by the Council, not by politics nor ego. This memory is what came to mind for Dooku when he woke up and began his morning routine. As he was washing his face, he stopped and realized perhaps the issue with the Jedi Order wasn't their younger and eager minds, but instead their hubris. Dooku spent a lot of time the previous night being upset at Maze, but this was conditioning. The Jedi bred individuals to be like him, to trust that the Council was independent of the Republic, to groom members into believing that all was right with their code and their order, and that serving the Senate meant serving the people. Somewhere along those lines, it got lost, and because of it, the Jedi were bound to suffer. Dooku didn't want that. In a perfect world, for him, the Order would thrive. It'd be able to help everyone in need. The Republic wouldn't be corrupt, and they would rescind their power from corporate overreach. The people of the galaxy would recognize the Jedi for what they were meant to be, not what they had become. Dooku moved about the temple after this initial realization in the morning. He felt that it was hopeless. The great change would come from instructing the next generation to see these fallacies, but that wouldn't work. Not even Yoda presided over every class of students. It was a fundamental issue that bled through the entire order, one that could only be changed with a cosmic undoing of their way of life. The Jedi Master found himself inside the Jedi Archives at the end of his walk. He didn't know how he got here, but he was. 
His friend Jocasta knew was working to become the head archivist. This dedication would see to it that she too would join the council, but at this point, it was work to become an archivist. Jocasta saw Dooku walk in, and the two of them walked towards each other, before bowing and jumping into conversation. She asked what was troubling him today, able to see his disheartened expression radiating from his face. Dooku looked over at the shelves and then back to her, telling her that he had questions about the order. She straightened her back and asked what he would like to know. Jocasta was very well informed about the order, but she knew with Dooku, this question would be about something she was completely unaware of. She was right. Dooku pondered about older texts, somewhere in the 5,000 to 20,000 year range, about how to handle ruptures in the order. Jocasta was completely stumped. She didn't even know what he meant by ruptures. She didn't even have texts from 15,000 years ago because there was a thousand years of darkness somewhere in their history, and actually, it may have been 15,000 or 1,500, she wasn't sure. That was the main point. Jocasta told him to follow as she scrambled back to the desk and sat down. She asked him why he needed this type of information, to which he spoke of just curiosity. Nothing was as simple as that with Dooku, and she looked up at him with a face that told him she could see through his bluff. Dooku smiled and told her that he was sincere with his motivations. He was curious about the legitimacy of this order, and he was curious on an informational piece of their history. Jocasta skimmed through thousands of texts, searching with all of her heart to find something that might get Dooku to have a bit of inner peace. She could tell from the question that her friend was curious about the longevity of the order, if it could really sustain life, even during a troublesome period of time. Clearly, he didn't see that their order still stood today, so that answer was pretty open. Eventually, she stopped and told him that there weren't any texts in the database that highlighted ruptures in the order. She asked if there were any other words that he might want to use to describe it. Dooku thought, and then spit out revolution, schism, division, separation, and maybe even estrangement. She poured through thousands of documents, still not finding anything of particular interest. She really couldn't find out if there was something there or not. When she stopped after about an hour or more of searching, she suggested that Dooku speak to the professor. He should be back from his latest gathering. Dooku agreed, quite right. Hu Yang would likely have the knowledge he needed. That droid had been around for the entire life of the Jedi Order. Dooku walked through the halls of the temple and over to the landing zone, looking for the crucible. He could see the beautiful vessel. When Dooku was a boy, they were able to land the vessel under the temple so it wasn't hanging out over the city from the main hangar bay. Dooku smiled as he walked up to the professor who turned around with joy in his voice, his expressionless gaze no different than it was around 40 years ago. Puyang asked Dooku what did he owe the pleasure of his company to. Dooku told the droid that he had questions about the past of their order. He nodded his head and asked that Dooku come into the ship. Once they got themselves sat down, Puyang pulled out various holograms and siphoned through them as Dooku explained what he was looking for. Each word was a key that would get Hu Yang closer to finding the information the Jedi Master was seeking. It didn't take too much time. Hu Yang had been alive since the very beginning of the Jedi Order, gracing the mountains of Ak 2 with the first Jedi Master to master harmony and balance with the universe. For Hu Yang, it was like yesterday, or as he always told the younglings, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. The droid turned around and placed a hologram on the table and told Dooku a story, one that took place thousands of years ago. The Jedi Order, as he explained, lived through cycles. There were these rises of spiritual awakenings, there were continuous advancements with the ruling government of the galaxy. Some 25,000 years ago, Coruscant was hundreds of miles lower to the surface, low enough where Mount Umate towered over the city. The capital was elsewhere in the core, but the Jedi after centuries of spiritual awakenings got close with the ruling government, though change is necessary. The government had its issues and was overthrown by another form. The Jedi moved away from the government of Coruscant to relearn their roots, to recapture the message left behind by their original elder, as they called him back then. There would be, along with these advancements with the ruling government, technological leaps. The Jedi were able to use hidden routes through space to make it from Octu to Coruscant. Over the years, they developed methods of hyperspace. Dooku looked at Hu Yang, getting the gist that this would be a history lesson. The professor waved his hand, insisting that Dooku silence his mind and follow along. It was important that he did so. Dooku listened as Hu Yang went along and spoke about the rises of darkness and then the cultural reset. This could be seen throughout history as well. Jocasta mentioned an age of darkness, and there were two. 25,000 years ago was the beginning of the rise of technology and civilization. 
but it was reset for the first time by an era of darkness in 15,000 BBY. The second one happened in 1500. The professor explained that these were very necessary. As the first Jedi Master insisted, these cycles would define the galaxy, but they could not be stopped. The droid walked to the edge of the room and expressed that there was a rupture coming. His eyes turned back to Dooku and told him that similarly to these several instances in the past, it could not be stopped, but the change necessary to fix it could result in the Jedi Order not crumbling. Dooku didn't understand, but Professor Hyang raised his hand, suggesting that he wasn't finished. In every era, there were those who defied the odds, those who made sure that while these cycles continued, the Order would survive. The Golden Era was over, Dooku knew that. Huyang continued and said that after every Golden Era, there was a Dark One, and traditionally following that, there was another failure as rebuilding a Jedi Order takes much more than any sole individual can handle. It is the failure of the one before that leads to the rise of a strong and sturdy Order. Yoda's instructors failed, Yoda did not, but time has done its damage, the cycle must continue. Huyang told Dooku that if he was willing to risk everything for being another piece in the cycle, then he would continue. If he was willing to be the failure before the success, then he would see to it that the Jedi Order persevered through another cycle. Dooku nodded his head. He wanted to ask why Huyang never said this to the council, but he couldn't. It wasn't his place. He knew the truth because he had lived it over and over again. The cycle would repeat no matter what, even if he warned them, even if he didn't. It didn't have to be Sith or political adversaries, it could be a fundamental collapse of the galactic system. Whatever it was, the Order always survived, and so Huyang told Dooku, the one who was willing to ensure the Jedi continued this cycle, that he must go to the planet of Dalna. If he truly wanted to take this responsibility, that was where he needed to go. Huyang gave Dooku a transmitter, one that had all the specific coordinates and hyperspace routes to get there. Truthfully, Dooku wasn't sure if he even wanted to do it. He was disappointed by the Jedi and their movement into obscurity, but he honestly didn't know if he was willing to throw away his life for this cause. He kinda did, but he also kinda didn't. In his mind, there had to be an easier way to make this work, but the truth is, there wasn't. It would be the easy route that could lead him into the hands of the ancient enemy of the Jedi. Dooku sat on this information for days, pondering over the risks and opportunities, and even the chances of success. This was a cycle, it was bound to repeat again. Maybe his time would be better spent causing a rupture in the cycle, allowing the Jedi to fizzle out or see if someone else could lead it to another place, but truthfully, that would only cause generational pain for those that followed his time. If he wanted to be a conscious Jedi, then he would take the brunt of the Force, so that a future generation of Jedi could be free from the pain that he felt at this moment. He could help lead a generation of Jedi into the future, so that they might have the true values of a Jedi. So after days of careful deliberation, he decided that he would go, taking a T-6 Jedi shuttle from the hangar bay and departing for Dalna. He had all the coordinates necessary to reach the location. His time in hyperspace was spent thinking through potential scenarios and maybe even things he could find. Truthfully, he was looking for a way to save the Jedi. That's why he went to Jocasta and Hu Yang. Now he had the opportunity to do it. Perhaps there was a reason the professor wanted him here. He wasn't given much information outside of what was said inside the Crucible, probably because Hu Yang thought that Dooku wouldn't do it. Ironically, if Dooku stayed, he would have been just as much of a problem and just as much of a reason for the failure of the Jedi Order. Upon his arrival to the planet, he landed amongst the brush. When he walked out, he could smell toxins and so he decided to wear a respirator over his face. The planet was very strong with the Force, but it was just as deadly. Dooku moved slowly through the brush, avoiding plant life and potentially venomous features. He wondered why Hu Yang never told him about this. Dooku stepped into the forest as he disappeared from the view of the ship. What was once a simple journey became mind-numbingly impossible. Each step, his eyes felt woozy, his brain lost cognitive ability, and he could sense the wrath of the planet seeping into his skin. Dooku stumbled over a rock and then looked back, realizing that he had no ship. He was simply alone and lost in a forest away from everyone. His mind drifted to some of Yoda's lessons about the Force, and he used them to power himself. The Jedi Master stumbled again and again, tripping in the trees, slipping on moist stones, and eventually losing consciousness on the ground somewhere in the forest of Dalna. When Dooku woke up, presumably days later, he found himself without his respirator. His eyes moved around as he looked at the temple around him. It was gorgeous. 
In its time, it would have been a wonder. Dooku then realized that he didn't have his respirator, but he also couldn't smell the toxins of the planet. He jumped from the ground and looked around. He didn't see any signs of life, aside from that of the forest, and yet miraculously, he could see a starship from where he was. How was that possible? He followed the coordinates, but it was clear that there was a huge brush before, unless of course, the force was strong with this location, maybe it was a mirage. Dooku looked around the temple, it was eerily silent. The nature outside the temple was very vibrant, but each step he took felt like it went deeper into nothingness. He pulled his lightsaber and ignited it, using it to guide him through such unknown territory. Everything was dark inside the temple. While it was still daytime, this place was covered by trees, and the inside was covered by a barely intact roof with vines and roots sprouting from every which direction. Dooku walked around, not considering much about this very vivid mirage, or in actuality, a vision. From his understanding, the Force or the Jedi of the past were defending this location. He eventually found the archives of the temple after restarting the generator inside the building. The lights were working so he no longer needed his lightsaber. Despite the natural growth taking place, it didn't take away from the aesthetic beauty of the temple. The floors were still beautiful, the walls had flags and banners draping from them. He understood that this meant the temple lived through the golden years of the Republic. The Jedi Master moved through the archives, looking for a computer console and finding it, before opening it up. While the temple on Coruscant was very well put together, Dooku noted how seamless the information was inside these archives. Everything he wanted was right here, at his disposal. But what Dooku found odd was the fact that the information was unlike the information on Coruscant. It seemed as if the Temple of Dalna was meant to be a place of learning, a location on the outskirts of the galaxy to be used for messages from the past. Everything inside of these archives were failures and lessons learned from them. The last Grand Master to visit this location was Ri Hisaka. He took over Yoda's position temporarily about 200 years ago. It was decided that the information inside these archives would remain here, simply due to the fact that the failures of the past did not pertain to the failures of the present, at least when Ri Hisaka was here. It was during the High Republic, so for the Grand Master, there was no reason for this information to be transported back to Coruscant. Dooku listened to the message left behind by Master Sokka. It basically said what Dooku would expect from a Jedi Master, that these failures were good to learn from, but at the moment, there was no need to make them public knowledge inside the archives on Coruscant for every Jedi. He spoke about the young, eager minds and how they should be focused on the future, not the past. It was a shame too. There was truthfully nothing wrong with this information. Dooku theorized that the Jedi Master was fearful that a young mind would be convinced to follow the schisms or revolutions of the past, when instead, the young mind should have listened about a past they were destined to repeat. Dooku wondered what this message went under inside the Coruscant archives, but he assumed it wasn't about Dalna or failures. The message was probably labeled under Grand Master Riki Saka, recording of blank year. With this understanding at his fingertips, Dooku dove in, reading and understanding everything there was to learn. He spent weeks on Dalna, learning about each of these failures and seeing how they paralleled the current fall of the Order. What was truly fascinating was how each of these failures came with a different story. They mirrored one another, but sometimes it was about the inability for a student to learn patience or harmony. Other times it came at a total collapse of the Order as a whole. Sometimes the Order was sucked into a war it could not win. It didn't matter which time it was, the outcome was the same an order on its knees at the will of the Force and left to its own devices. Each time, when the Jedi were close to destruction, one or two members would rebuild it. Didn't matter if there were 200 or 20,000 Jedi, they found a way to recover through the guidance of the few willing to give everything to their order. In a similar fashion, they had their early struggles. The first entry of life as a Jedi in their rebuilding phase was always filled with failures and many times, great resets. A student, typically the most powerful, would try and access knowledge that he or she shouldn't have. The individual would grow jealous or become corrupt. It didn't matter. All that did was the fall that came after. Of course, there were rebuilding orders that faced destruction at the hands of outside elements, but it made Dooku wonder what student of his would lead to his demise. Perhaps he didn't know that future Jedi yet, but he fully believed in this. If he could create a splinter group of Jedi, then maybe he could save the Jedi Order. Though there was something that Dooku found inside these archives. It was called the Fallen Order Initiative, created about 19,000 years ago. It entails how an individual should go about saving the Order. It was, at that point, 
gathered up from 6,000 years worth of knowledge of Jedi history. There was information on how an individual like Dooku should go about preserving the history of the Order and ensuring that it was never lost to time. The Archive also told him about Octu, and if everything is lost in the main temple during the time, then it can be rebuilt by the information on Octu, which is why it was kept there. The hope was that the information on Octu never left their homeworld, but if it did, then it should be taken care of. The temple on Octu was a relic, and many of these Elder Jedi recognized it, but the relic should never overshadow the needs of the current Order. If it took removing those books from Octu to rebuild the Jedi, then so be it. Dooku understood this, and so he spent the next couple weeks cleaning up the Temple of Dalna, before turning to Coruscant to bring as many as he could with him. The following year of Dooku's life would lead him into 47 BBY, where he would have established a small secret Jedi Enclave on Dalna. There were about 27 Jedi in this enclave, including the likes of Qui-Gon Jinn. Dooku didn't take the stand as a Grand Master, but he encouraged his fellow Jedi to return to their basics. Obi-Wan was never brought to Dalna, due to him still being a youngling, 10 years old, during this year. There weren't any council members brought along for this, and the existence of this enclave was kept in secrecy. The council was aware that Dooku was spending a lot of time away from Coruscant, but they didn't see that as a negative. They just never believed that he would go as far as to work away from the Jedi Order. Instead of this enclave at Dalna, he instructed his fellow Jedi in the original texts of the Jedi Order, not taking the books from Octu, but using their knowledge and spreading what was kept inside of them. This enclave wasn't struggling though. These Jedi were all working at the best of their abilities. The planet of Dalna was strong with the Force, but there were still many more wonders that the Jedi were not familiar with yet. Sytho Dyas and his master Eula Braylon were also a part of this, however, they were never on Dalna. Their mission was to go out into the galaxy and find more forgotten secrets of the Jedi and the Force. They were able to discover the planet of Tantalor on their journeys, which they informed Dooku about. The Jedi Master would eventually find himself out on Tantalor to investigate, shortly after Eula and Sypha left the system. The difference with Dooku's order wasn't noticeable from the outside. They were the same thing to most people. They acted as Jedi, they went on mercy missions, they wore Jedi robes. Nothing from the exterior was different. However, these Jedi understood the force they connected with. They understood their purpose in the galaxy. Their feelings in reaction in relation to the force were much more barbaric in a sense. They were emotional feelings rather than political ones. They reconnected with the notion that to be a Jedi was to fail. They understood that to be a Jedi, they were to feel and to form attachments. However, it was taught that attachment can be bad, which was in line with the instructions of their order. The code forbade attachments, not of the normal sense, but of jealousy and controlling. Attachments in of themselves weren't bad, and Dooku understood this. He never enforced rules for or against attachments. He taught what the books held, and asked that his peers commit themselves to the words of the elders. As Dooku landed on Tantalor, he could sense the radiating force in the planet. As he was moving through the facility, he eventually had a run-in with the Jedi Captain Bacta. Dagon Gera, at this point of being placed in his semi-permanent nap chamber, was fed up with the Jedi. So when he found Dooku, he didn't care what kind of Jedi he was. He had a bone to pick with him simply for being a Jedi, something that Dooku handled expertly and with precision. Dagon would be buried after losing his fight, and Dooku would feel inclined to inform his fellow Jedi about it. But nothing major would come from it. Their focus was on Dalna. Once they finished, they would move to Tantalor and build their tomb. The next seven years would be very similar. The Jedi Order of Coruscant would continue to fall down into the path of corruption. The Order of Dalna would give the Jedi as a whole a better reputation. But that wasn't saying much. The Coruscant Order was corroding, just like the Republic. There would be a point when it burst. The Council was completely oblivious to the now 59 members that served with Dooku, Qui-Gon, and Sytho Dyas on Dalna. These Jedi varied in range, but most of them were willing to be different and act like true Jedi. There were people given the opportunity, but they never joined and never told a soul. Though the reputation of Dooku's order was cult-like, sadly. They were seen as individuals claiming to be true Jedi, but secretly serving Dooku's own ambitions. While this was seen as mildly concerning, many Jedi who called it a cult were overconfident in their order to worry about it. Dooku's Jedi would fade from existence. It was just a matter of time until it didn't. These thoughts on Dooku's little group of Jedi were shared among the many that were given a chance to join, but they never told the Council about it. The year was 40 BBY, and the Jedi of Dalna were expanding outwards. While they didn't have the intentions to build on Tantalor yet, they were bringing more children into their order. 
Their work in the outer and mid rim is what gave the order on Coruscant more breathing room in the eyes of citizens. However, there was an issue with this. The senator from Naboo took interest in it. He could see that there was another group of Jedi going against the status quo, and as someone who understood the Force, Palpatine believed it would be better to balance things out by bringing new Jedi into his Sith Order. Not officially as Sith, but as Darksiders. Palpatine was very confident in the rumors surrounding these Jedi, the belief that they were a cult, individuals following someone's singular ideals. What Palpatine didn't realize is that these were true Jedi. Dalna was difficult enough for Jedi to get to, with coordinates. Palpatine never considered how challenging it was for him to get to the planet because he put a tracker on a Jedi shuttle and traced it to the system, not even thinking twice about it. Though truthfully, he never considered that this planet was a difficult system to get to. Sure, challenging, but in a way, similar to getting to Kessel. So, he never overthought it. When Palpatine landed, he was greeted by Dugu and Qui-Gon. The Sith Lord approached as Senator from Naboo, Sheev Palpatine. He expressed interest in their project and told them that he heard they were working separately from the temple on Coruscant. Dooku nodded to Qui-Gon as if to shoo him away, as he and Palpatine walked away from the temple. Their conversation moved in circles. Dooku could tell that something was off with Palpatine. No senator would track Jedi to a location like this. Plus, no senator could maneuver through the maelstrom between the hyperspace lane and Dalna without guidance from the Force. But Dooku, even though he knew that Palpatine was some sort of dark side marauder, didn't make a move. He wanted Palpatine to fall into his palm. There was a reason he was here. He would have to eventually show his cards, so Dooku naturally acted like the leader of a cult. He spoke about how his ideals were shaping the Order into something more than the Jedi. Palpatine was young and eager, probably about 20 years younger than Dooku, from what he could tell at least. But the excitement that Sheev had about getting Dooku onto his side was unreal. It was obvious, perhaps more obvious because they were on Dalna, but Palpatine was trying to turn them to the dark side or something. Maybe had Dooku been on Coruscant, he would have fallen for it. Maybe he and his order could have been fooled, but the force was strong with Dalna, and it was even more so with the Jedi. So at the end of a very long and boring speech, Dooku told Palpatine that he had a question. Palpatine asked what it was, as Dooku ignited his lightsaber and swung. Before the blade hit Palpatine, he raised his hands and his eyes became covered in a yellow glow. Dooku tilted his head and forced his way forward, only for Dooku to duck out of the way. How could the Jedi see right through him? None of them ever did. It didn't make sense. Palpatine ignited his lightsabers and swung forward, but Dooku was quick to parry each strike, thrusting one of Palpatine's blades out of his hands, almost instantly. His hand moved behind his own back as he focused on his opponent. The Jedi Master was more efficient than almost anyone in his entire generation. He jabbed forward, kicking his feet to the ground and throwing up dust, as his moves were soft, precise, and deadly. Dooku's swings weren't heavy, but the curvature of his blade and finesse of his strikes made his lightsaber feel like the broadside of a star cruiser. Palpatine found himself backpedaling immediately. This didn't make any sense, as he cut down trees next to him, they didn't fall. It was all a mirage. Dooku slipped under a confused Palpatine before dragging the Dark Apprentice's blade around into his own stomach. He panicked for a moment, but Dooku shoved him backwards. Palpatine was a Sith. He was pure evil. He had a moment to reconcile and Dooku would have given it, but he tried to strike again and again. He swung around his blade before Dooku eventually took his life. When it was over, Dooku felt shame for the young Sith. He would have made a fine Jedi but they investigated the starship only to find nothing. Qui-Gon and sifo were sent back to Coruscant with the ship and the body to prove the existence of the Sith, but the Jedi Council didn't heed their warning. So, Dooku's Jedi stuck to themselves, slowly increasing their numbers and continuing to help people. With Palpatine dead, Plagueis started training Maul as his own student. Because Maul wasn't well versed in politics, it would take another apprentice for Plagueis to get the political leverage he wanted. It was pretty annoying, but there wasn't really anything he could do about it. He would have to train Maul to be a student so that they could continue their dark side rituals. In the years that followed Palpatine's death, Dooku would acquire new students in the form of Anakin Skywalker, Barriss Afi, Caleb Doom, and Ahsoka Tano. These children were very talented, and they'd be trained to become true Jedi, but as Dooku feared, trouble was on the horizon. It all started with the blockade over Naboo. While it was initially supposed to be a Sith plan, the Trade Federation, after losing contact with Sidious, went ahead with it. Instead of a blockade though, it was a massacre. They destroyed everything on the planet and turned it into a mining and foundry world. It was all to prove that the Republic had no power, 
What followed was more political squabbling, Jedi response from Coruscant, and a new Chancellor. Though this new Chancellor was the final nail in the coffin, the galaxy slipped into civil war. The Republic split into five different factions, and the Jedi unified with the elite class, ironically. The Dalna Jedi did go in to help, against Dooku's better judgement, and after six years of war, the Coruscant Order was in shambles. Only 320 members remained. Dooku's order was cut into a third. Most of the survivors were children when the war started. Among the survivors of Dooku's order that weren't children were Dooku, Sephidias, Yula Braylon, and Qui-Gon Jinn. But that didn't mean it was going to be bad. Some of the members from the Coruscant order left. This included Tara Sanube, Jakasta Nu, Shakti, and Plo Koon. They brought with them a number of younglings and Padawans. It boosted Dooku's order to 91 members, which wasn't a whole lot, but it was a solid starting point. While the Civil War destroyed the Jedi of old, it didn't destroy the Sith. The Sith, ironically, destroyed themselves. How, you ask? Plagueis kept messing with the Force, like poking a sleeping bear. Eventually, the Force got annoyed. Initially, the Force reacted to Plagueis messing with it by creating Anakin. Plagueis never knew Anakin was created, so without Palpatine killing him in a drunk stupor, he and Maul kept playing with fire, and like an angry bear, the Force eventually had enough. The two Sith eventually conducted a ritual, and a Force Storm was created, sending a burst of electricity into their lair, detonating their little altar and spewing acid onto their bodies and the floor. Whether it be the acid, or the fire, or the lightning that killed them, no one would ever know. There then remained two different Jedi Orders, for the years following the Civil War that ravaged the galaxy. The Republic was in shambles, the Trade Federation and its allies were nothing more than AI ran machines that have been since shut down. The Jedi Order of Old went to Tython, where they would attempt to reconnect, but eventually they'd be drowned out by their own failure. Whether it be members running to Dalna, or leaving the Jedi Order as a whole behind, the Old Order died out. Dooku's remained strong, and it continued to build for years to come. Qui-Gon trained Anakin, who eventually became a predecessor, one that would not destroy the Jedi. The chaos that followed the rebuilding of the Jedi Order is exactly what Huang predicted, but this time was a galactic civil war. Dooku wouldn't have to face the loss of his entire order, but the choices of those that followed him would decide his future. Long after Dooku's passing when Anakin was himself, the Elder of the Order at the age of 87 oversaw the decision of a new phase. Grogu was in his first hundred years by this point, and he had long since abandoned the Jedi path, though that abandonment was none of his choosing. One of Anakin's pupils brought Grogu to Tantalor, where the main temple was now located. Master Skywalker gave Grogu a choice because as a Jedi, it was right and moral to give a new Jedi, not a child, a choice. Attachment was necessary, but attachments of jealous and controlling nature lead to darkness. Skywalker allowed Grogu to choose between his attachments or the Jedi way. He chose the latter, where he would learn to train for years, eventually becoming a spiritual leader and oversee many others like himself now. Grogu chose the Jedi path, and as it was by Professor Yang's words, and the Jedi that came before and after him, a new cycle had begun. And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to all of our patrons, Benjamin Wells, Ozpin, Angel Dust, Alexandra Reese, The Beginning and End, Django Fett Clone, Nick5098, IMTJ Recluse, Ben Ingram, The Big Red Pure Mark, Diamond Constant, Darth Nemesis, Lord Tibbs, CC2024, Galaxy Gaming, Tristan, Mandalore, Sir William1767, Darth Revan, Granity Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Cullen Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlanger, The Last Jedi, Apollo, We Was 670, Anika Shank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Nox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tam, John Ndugwin, Sansa Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet, Gamer, Lord Cali, Galaxy 66, Mamino Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Forwards Legacy Star Wars, Airbus, Rex the Wolf, The Man Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing. For supporting channel, smash that like button. Let's talk about the story. So as you can tell, there's a very big influence from what Balin talks about as cycles. I believe these cycles existed for the 25,000 plus years of the Jedi Order, and I wanted to kind of explore them. I don't believe there's anything in canon or legends that goes far beyond, and so I wanted to kind of play with the idea that there are dark ages in their history. So I wanted to kind of give like this precedent for like these cycles to take place between Old Republic and High Republic, and then way before Old Republic, so that these cycles are something that will repeat, and these cycles are what Balin talks about, is they keep happening. Whether it's through the same means or not, they keep happening, and so that's what I wanted to play with here, as Dooku's order is kind of what he should have done, and that, and that point where Dooku chooses to go this way is kind of like, he could have done it in canon if he ever did this, and I'm kind of insinuating that he did do this in canon, but he went the easy route instead. So, 
Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed. I love you all. Spread the love. And always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.